Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, my, my name's uh, Greg. I'm an alcoholic. And um, thank you so much for the lovely warm welcome um, you gave me at this meeting. And um, I've been to this meeting a few times in the past. And, and, and I really want to say um, and acknowledge how much I love the way, the way it's run. I, I just love everything about the way you people run this meeting. Um, and I, I just want to just bring that out into the light. Um, thank you very much, Tamara, for my dear friend Tamara, for asking me to to come and speak this evening. Um, she asked me probably several months ago, and um, you know, if you have the kind of alcoholic thinking that I have, you know, you'd have been you know churning and churning and churning and churning, and 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 you know, soon after she asked me, I knew I was going to be on holiday as well in another country. Um, so I'm going to be speaking from a hotel room, which I'm in my hotel room now. I'm on my phone. It, it, it doesn't feel comfortable. I need my laptop. I've only got a mini big book. I haven't got my, my big, big book, which I have at home with everything highlighted. I've got loads of things highlighted in here, but probably not as much as the book I have at home. Um, and because of all those things, I convinced myself today, especially today, that I was just going to... Um, just uh <laughs> just just not sound right tonight so uh, please god help me and uh please god set aside everything i think i know um about the big book about the 12 step program um about you god um and please god give me a new experience um so 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 that i can learn something new as i do every day amen um and every day is a day when i learn something new Every day I learn something new, um, usually specifically about how to respond to people. For example, I might have responded yesterday or in the past to something, some situation, any situation. And I always have the thought, it's automatic, and it says, Greg, you could have done that a little bit better. Maybe you could have said this sentence that might have made it more the solution come quicker and so every day i'm open to learning um thank god and um you know one one thing and before i get started one thing i try to do every day is i, I try to say greg imagine today imagine you're starting the day with knowing nothing about alcoholics anonymous about the 12 steps so so kind of have that 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 hunger to learn of you know that 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 rawness. You know where you're really hungry to learn and and um, and and, uh, and hungry to recover, um, because it is it, alcoholism is a killer disease, um, and and I know that because I've been extremely close to death on very very many occasions, and I've been extremely close to permanent psychiatric hospital under lots of medication. Many many occasions, I've been extremely close to that. And um, my sobriety dates the 21st of July, 1996. And um, I know today, because I didn't know then, but I know today, that's when God parted me from alcohol um, and has kept me parted up until today. And uh, I have a sponsor. Um, I have taken the 12 steps. I try to live in step 10, 11 and 12. Uh, I sponsor men, and uh, I I try to help others on a daily basis, and I try to get closer and closer to God each day throughout the day. I I do things like, please God, help me to, every breath I take, to think of you. So that kind of forces me to think of God and connect to God every ticking moment. and it helps me. It helps me massively. And I haven't always been like this. I haven't always been like this. I, I came to our college in 1996, uh, as I said, after many close to death experiences. And um, I had a sponsor, lovely, lovely gentleman, um, took me through the 12 steps with the book, went to his house. 
And um, and and he said, I, I suppose I say I suppose because I, I, it's a presumption I've got. Um, he said, right, what you need to do now, Greg, is you just stay sober. So you don't drink, you go to meetings. You don't drink, you go to meetings. If you've got a problem, you know, anything happening at home, at work, big problems, step your meetings up. Go to more meetings. Um, and I did that. And this gentleman, you know, I, I loved him dearly um, when he was alive. And uh, I, I really mean that. And he helped me massively. Um, but, but I was always having these, these problems. Uh, these problems with with myself, with my thinking, with my behaviours, with my attitudes, and with people, and I kept saying, "Come on, Greg, just look. You're sober. It's, it's okay. You know, it's okay to misbehave sometimes. It's okay to freak out sometimes. It, just stay sober. Just you know, go go to another meeting." And and I remember once when I was having some problems with relationship. I mean, the story of my life: problems with relationships. Um, and this guy said to me, Greg, how many meetings do you go to a week? I, I said three. He said, no, you need to go to four. If you go to four, you'll be fine. The reason I'm sharing this, ladies and gentlemen, is because I'm going to start reading the doctor's opinion and step one soon. And um, I, myself, and I, I say this to you also, guys, try and listen to the real importance of this going to meetings and choosing yourself not to drink and i might read it out somewhere i might read somewhere um where it really highlights um, the necessity of the meeting the meeting is absolutely essential but um there are other necessities as well which we're going to go through in this book so um just before I start, Tradition 5, our Tradition 5, our Plus Anonymous, says each group, like this one, has one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. That can be a newcomer, that can be somebody 10, 20, 30, 40 years sober, suffering, hurting, for various reasons. And in 1942, one of our founders, Bill W., said, our chief responsibility our, us, you and me, our chief responsibility to the newcomer is an adequate presentation of the program. So please, God, help me to try to adequately present to you and to myself, because I need to hear this stuff daily. Believe me, I need to probably, I need to hear this stuff more than you guys do. So help me to adequately present the doctor's opinion to you and step one to you. Okay, so I've got a little plan. We're going to go through the uh, doctor's opinion. I'm going to highlight some pertinent parts the same way as uh, I do. We do big book studies, which I attend or I host or, or whatever. Um, and then we're going to look at more about alcoholism. And I'm going to try and go into some some depth of some of the key parts of that and really, you know, really bring that insane alcoholic thinking out into the open so we can look at it and say, is that me? Is that my thinking? Or do I not believe that? Is that not applicable to me? Am I different? Yeah. So let's begin. Forward to the first edition. I'm just going to read one paragraph. We, the first 100 of Alcoholics Anonymous, are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics, so to show us, Precisely how we have recovered, and that's in italics, is the main purpose of this book. So hang on a second. They're not going to show us how they recovered. They're going to show us precisely how they recovered. And you know what? All we have to do is follow that. That's it. Yep. Follow it. Follow the book. Follow what they did. For them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication will be necessary. We think this account of our experiences will help everyone to better understand the alcoholic. Many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person. And besides, we're sure that our way of living has its advantages for all. Of course it does. Fantastic design for living. I'm living evidence of that. So let's begin the doctor's opinion. Who's the doctor? Dr. Silkworth, Dr. William Silkworth, he was a specialist, a specialist in alcoholic and drug addiction. Okay, 
So he would have done his medical training and then he would have done some additional training. I believe it's two to three years, maybe longer, but it's definitely two to three years as, as, a, ba as a basic training in addiction and alcoholism. OK. The book was written and they asked the doctor, please, doctor, can, can you go through our book? And can you write something? Can, can you can you write, you know, write something about about our book? Whatever you want, write something about our book. So we of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the reader will be interested, the reader, you and me, right now we're reading this, will be interested in the medical estimate of the plan of recovery described in this book. Convincing testimony must surely come from medical men who have had experience with the sufferings of our members and have witnessed our return to health. A well-known doctor, chief physician to a nationally prominent hospital specialising in alcoholic and drug addiction gave Alcoholics Anonymous this letter. To whom it may concern, I have specialised in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. So Dr William Silkwood is a specialist in alcoholism, OK? He saw hundreds and thousands of alcoholics, OK, as patients who wanted help, OK? They needed help. They were dying, these people. In late 1934, I attended a patient who, though had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, Bill W, that was, was an alcoholic of a type. I had come to regard as hopeless. So alcoholic of a type. So think chronic alcoholic, real alcoholic, alcoholic of a type. OK. OK. So the alcoholic of a type is not the heavy drinker or the moderate drinker. OK. That, that's this is the one who has the allergy. OK. And, all, and the doctor here mentions Bill W was a competent businessman with good earning capacity. And I believe in those days, and, and I understand this, I believe in those days they believed, well, hang on, if you had a good education, a good job, a good family, a good upbringing, a good salary, why do you end up in this mess with alcoholism? You see, whereas, whereas today we know, you and I know, that it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter if you're a millionaire, as we know from Roland Hazard's story. It doesn't matter who you are, how rich or how poor you are, what job you have, whether you're thin, whether you're fat, whether you've got no hair, or whether you've got long hair, blue hair, it doesn't matter. If you have alcoholism, and if you're the real alcoholic, you need this in the same doses as I need it. Okay? So this is not about who we are or what we look like or where we come from, what we believe. In the course of his third treatment, so Bill W's on his third treatment now, he acquired some ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics. So he's sharing with other alcoholics, help others. And this is what you need to do. Prayer would have been part of that conversation. Yeah, I know that for a fact. Prayer and help others. Prayer and help others. Now, hear this, ladies and gentlemen, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with others. How many of you sponsor people and say to your sponsees, listen, you've got to go out and help people. You've got to look for sponsees. I didn't do it for years. I only learned this, you know, a few months ago. OK. So you must do likewise with others. And it's my job to say that. Hey, I'm going to help you, John, Julie, Susie. But when I help you. And what, what, I, what I give to you, you must give that to other people. Go and find newcomers and give it to other people. OK, this has become the basis. So carrying the message and helping others. Carrying the message and helping others has become the basis of Alcoholics Anonymous, of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered. The doctor says, Dr. Silkwood says that he personally knows scores of cases who were alcoholics of the type with whom other methods failed. If I go to a doctor and I say, doctor, I can't stop drinking. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm insane. I'm behaving badly. I'm stealing. I'm using foul language. I'm, you know, I'm going crazy. What do you think the doctor's going to give me? What do, what do doctors give people? A prescription. A prescription. Yeah? And that's what doctors do. 
That's their job and that's okay. That's what they do. Here's a prescription, Greg. Take these pills, take one three times a day with a meal and you'll be fine. You'll stop smashing your mum's furniture up. You'll stop stealing. You'll stop behaving badly. You'll stop planning serious crimes, which thank God I never actually did, but got very close to them. Yeah, just take these pills three times a day. Well, do you know what? I had hundreds of prescriptions, hundreds of prescriptions from different psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors, specialists. Take this prescription, take this medicine, take this one at night, take this one in the morning, take the blue one on Saturday, take the yellow pill on Monday morning. And you'll stop smashing things. You'll stop hitting people. You'll stop driving your car like a lunatic. You'll stop being insane. Just take these pills, as I tell you. Never worked. So the doctor says here, and he's telling us this, so, so we don't have to experiment this today. Oh, oh AA is not working. Well, I've been to a few meetings and, uh, well, no, well, you know, I don't like those women. I don't like those men. And, you know, well, he's a bit arrogant, you know, and she looked, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm going to do, do you know what? I'm going to get a new hobby. I'm going to, I'm going to go horse riding or I'm going to go, um, you know, mountain climbing or something. That will help me. That will help my alcoholism. I spent years doing that. I spent years doing and suffering deeply, suffering with pain. I mean, real deep emotional, psychological pain. Okay. So the doctor's telling us that other methods failed completely. These facts appear to be of extreme medical importance, okay, because of the extraordinary possibilities of rapid growth inherent in this group that they may mark a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. God, that's gibberish. What does that mean? It means that this thing, what was happening then, was so, it was, it was very tentative, but it was so powerful and there was they were seeing some results which these doctors altogether collectively were unable to achieve outside their synthetic knowledge, unable to achieve. They were seeing results. So this marked a benchmark in the history of the treatment of alcoholism. OK, so that's what that basically means. And Dr. Silkwood says you may rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves. OK, right. So the physician who, at our request, gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms that we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe that the body of the alcoholic is as abnormal as his mind. OK, it didn't satisfy us to be told that we can't control our drinking because we're maladjusted to life in full flight from reality or outright mental defectives. These things were true with some of us, in fact, to a considerable extent with all of us. But we are sure our bodies are sickened as well. And in our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. So the doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. What kind of allergy? An allergy, the same as a, a peanut allergy. I have the peanut, my throat swells up, I go to the hospital. He says, you've got an allergy, Greg. It's peanuts. It showed up in your blood. You can't eat peanuts. No more peanuts. I say, OK. I'll never touch another peanut in my life. But with the alcoholic, we have something additional. We have the compulsion, the mental obsession to drink with the allergy. So my thinking, and this is me, and I'm sure lots of you are very, very similar. I'm at the end now. I mean, for months, you know, for years, I, was, I couldn't drink, but I strung. And I'd have one or two sips. Oh, my God, my heart's beating. I'm going to die. Oh, God, I'll never do it again. Oh, please don't let me die, God. Please save me. And I would be like that. I would be like that. And then a few hours later, repeat it again and again and again and again and again and again until I was inches away from death or permanent psychiatric damage. So the doctor says we have an allergy. As ex-problem drinkers, we can say his explanation makes good sense. It explains for many things which, which we can otherwise not account. OK, the doctor also says that if somebody's jittery, befogged, you've got to have a detox, a detox, clear the brain before we can talk about the program. OK, because then you have a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer in here. OK, so the doctor continues. The subject presented in this book to me seems to be of paramount importance to those afflicted with alcoholic addiction. I say this after many years experience as medical doctor of one of the oldest hospitals in the country treating alcoholic and drug addiction. There was therefore a sense of real satisfaction 
when I was asked to contribute a few words on a subject, alcoholism is the subject, which is covered in such masterly detail in these pages. So the doctor is endorsing the book. Doctors don't endorse things that easily. They need to see, you know, solid, something really solid for them to say, hey, this is brilliant. And this is what the doctor's saying. So I take note of that because that stops me as an alcoholic ridiculing the book because my thinking can ridicule it. I don't today, but I used to. You see, I used to. You can ridicule the book. The doctor says, we doctors have realised for a long time that some form of moral psychology was of urgent importance to alcoholics, but its application presented difficulties beyond our conception, outside the scientific knowledge, outside the synthetic knowledge. Many years ago, one of the leading contributors, Bill W., to this book came under our care in this hospital, and while here, he acquired some ideas which he put into practical application when, at once, at once, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Think of that in chapter five, yeah. Later, he, Bill W., requested the privilege of being allowed to tell his story to other patients here. And with some misgiving, we consented. Of course, they're misgiving. It's early days, very tentative, meaning experimented. You know, they're seeing some results. You know, is, is it going to work? Will this last? Is it just a five minute wonder? So that's why they had some misgiving, the doctors. The cases we have followed through have been most interesting. In fact, many of them are amazing. The unselfishness of these men, as we've come to know them, the entire absence of profit motive and their community spirit is indeed inspiring to one who has laboured long and wearily in this alcoholic field. Dr. Silkwood was so deeply committed to wanting to cure alcoholics. He was so deeply committed. They believe, the alcoholics, they believe in themselves and still more in the power, capital P, which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. That's the first mention in the doctor's opinion of a power greater than ourselves, a God, a higher power. That's the first mention. There's three mentions. We're going to get to the other two in, in, in a few minutes. OK, so they believe in themselves and still more in the power which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. Hang on a second. So there's a power which stops the alcoholic from dying. Tell me more. Of course, an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor, and this often requires a definite hospital procedure before psychological measures can be of maximum benefit. We believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class, to the real alcoholic, the chronic alcoholic, and the phenomenon of craving, the allergy, the obsession of the mind does not occur ever, never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types, me, can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. Some questions, guys. For me, you can ask yourself the same. Greg, do you believe you can never safely use alcohol in any form at all? Yes, absolutely. And once having formed the habit, they found they cannot break it. Once having uh, lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. What does that mean, people say? Frothy emotional appeal? What was that jargon? I'll tell you. Something like, Greg, please stop drinking, Greg. Your mother loves you so much. You're killing her. You're killing your grandmother. Please think of your children. You know, you're neglecting them. You're you're so selfish with your drinking. Doesn't work. Goes in one ear and out of the other. Doesn't work. Frothy emotional appeal. The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. One alcoholic talking to another. That's what they mean. In nearly all cases, here's the second mention of a higher power, of God, a power greater than yourself. Their ideals must Someone told me there's no musts in the big book. 
In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if, if they are to recreate their lives. So another question there, guys. Are you a real alcoholic? Do you want to recreate your life? Yes or no? It's a yes or no to that. So do I want to recreate my life? Yes. Well, then my ideals must be grounded in a power greater than myself. If they're not, I'm going to struggle. And I've had that for years. Well, I said at the beginning, go to four meetings, Greg. Go to 10 meetings a week. Pull yourself together. You're in AA now. You haven't drunk for five years. You know, you shouldn't be behaving like this. You shouldn't be thinking like this. That's what people used to say to me. People trying to help me. Lovely, beautiful people. Yeah, that's how it was for me. Okay? So the doctor goes on to say that if any feel, if any people feel that a psychiatrist directing a hospital for alcoholics, we appear somewhat sentimental. Let them stand with us on the firing line. See the tragedies, despairing wives, husbands, families, little children. Let the solving of these alcoholic problems become a part of their daily work and even in the, of their sleeping moments. And the most cynical will not wonder why we have accepted and encouraged this movement. So the doctors have accepted and encouraged the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous. Why? Simple answer. Common sense. They saw something working. They saw something working that they've already told us they couldn't make this work. They couldn't fix people. The doctors already told us that in the, in the preceding page. Okay? Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the truth from the false. We become delusional. We don't know what's true, what's false. We're lost. But if you're like me, you never feel lost. To them, the alcoholic life seems the only normal one. Normal. Yeah? Alcoholic life, normal. Yeah? Drinking round the clock, behaving insanely normal. You know, and that was me. They are restless, irritable and discontented unless they can, again, experience the sense of ease and comfort, ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. I just want to throw something in there. Somebody said to me a few months ago, Greg, where do you get your ease and comfort from today? You don't drink. Where do you get your ease and comfort from? God, I said. That's just my answer. After they have succumbed to the desire again, relapse, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again, I promise I'll never do it again, please forgive me, I'm so sorry. This is repeated over and over, we do it again and again and again, and unless the person, the real alcoholic, the chronic alcoholic can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. Do I believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? I do. Entire psychic change. God, that sounds meant. What is that? A spiritual experience, a change in thinking. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it when we, when we continue. On the other hand, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, the same person who seemed doomed and has so many problems he ever despaired of solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. The only effort necessary is that you're required to follow a few simple rules. Rules? They told me there's no rules in AA. There aren't any rules in AA. That's correct. But there are 12 steps in AA. Because I've got 12 steps written here, so I must have learned that's on one of the many, many big book study groups that I went to. OK, so let's continue. Men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appe uh, appeal. Doctor, I can't go on like this. I've got everything to live for. Please help, help to stop. Face with this problem. If the doctor's honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although the doctor gives all that is in him, it often isn't enough. You know, and it's no different today, guys. You know, I've got so many people that I, you know, I'm trying to help that. Are, they haven't stopped drinking yet and that you know they're going to doctors and they're taking the medication and they're you know they're, they're, they're getting worse i'll be honest they're getting worse but here's the third mention of a power of a higher power of god one feels the doctor says one feels that something more than human power 
is needed to produce the essential psychic change. So the psychic change is not just, it doesn't just need to be entire, it's essential. We have to have it. It's not optional. We can't untick that box. We've got to tick that box. Essential psychic change. Yep. Yeah. Do you want to recover? Got to have an essential psychic change. Three mentions of a power greater than yourself. Yeah. Three mentions of a power greater than yourself. Okay. Though the aggregate of, uh, through the aggregate of recoveries resulting from psych psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit we've made little impression upon the problem as a whole. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. So you see, again, not just prescriptions in those days, but hey, Greg, you've got alcoholism, right? Let's send you for psychotherapy, counseling, hypnotherapy, reflexology, acupuncture, yeah? Mindfulness, crystal healing, you know, banging shame and drums. I've done all that stuff. I've done it all. It was nice, but it, it didn't relieve my alcoholism. Okay, so the doctor says he doesn't hold with those who believe alcoholism is entirely a problem of mental control. The doctor had so many men who, for example, worked for a period of months to solving some problem or a business deal, which had to be done by a certain date favorable to them. They had one drink a day or so before the date, and immediately the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests, and the important appointment was not met. These men were not drinking to escape, so the real alcoholic doesn't drink to escape. They drink to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. How many times have you tried to frantically, desperately, manically tried to stop? There are situations, many situations, which arise out of the phenomenon of craving, which causes many men, uh, which causes men and women to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. Commit suicide, guys, commit suicide. Um, as it says later on, you know, so many people dropping into oblivion. You know, if only they had the opportunity that we enjoyed. They tell us that and, and there is a solution. So. The classification of alcoholic seems most difficult. We're not going to go into that. Again, the alcoholic, real alcoholic, is over-remorseful, makes many resolutions, but never a decision. You know, when I first read this, I thought, that's me, that's me, that's me. I identified so much with this. It's like they're talking about me. I've never read a book in my life that was like that. Okay, so they're going into the classification of alcoholics. Uh, the real alcoholic, um, the, the, the alcoholic who, 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 who drinks, um, who stops drinking for a while and then has another drink after a period of time, believing that he's not in danger, the manic depressive alcoholic. And then it says all these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy which differentiates these people, differentiates the real chronic alcoholics and sets them apart as a distinct entity. It has never been by any treatment with which we are familiar permanently eradicated. So let me just say that again. So the doctor's saying that alcoholism, the real alcoholic, whatever treatments they gave them, they've never been able to permanently eradicate it. It's really important for me to note that and hear that often, daily, actually, I need to hear that. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. That's it. That's the only relief to suggest. And this is after years of these specialists in alcoholism and drug addiction trying everything to cure and treat alcoholics unsuccessfully, mostly. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to go straight to step one. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives become unmanageable. Powerless, no power, no control. Think of the word control before we read this. So I'm going to read more about alcoholism. I'm very aware of the time, so I'm going to fly through some bits of here and, and I want to finish with a couple of bits in there as a solution and then that will be it. So... 
most of us have been unwilling to admit, unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics, okay? So if you look at step one, we admitted we weren't. So forget the rest of the wording. We admitted. Have you admitted? Yes or no? Greg, have you admitted? Yes, that you're powerless over. Yes. So the admitted is a, is a very important word in step one. We admitted. We acknowledged. We said, yes, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble with alcoholism. With alcoholism. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think he's bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Okay? Our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea, this is, this is classically me, the idea that somehow, someday he will control and enjoy his drinking is, is the great obsession, the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. My sponsor said to me, if, if that's not your great obsession, you're not an abnormal drinker. I said, listen, that's been my obsession from, from you know, day one of drinking. Okay? The great obsession of every abnormal drinker that somehow he will control it. The assistance of this illusion is astonishing. Many people pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. Fully concede to our innermost self. Every day in my prayers, I say, God, I surrender. Dear God, I surrender. I surrender myself to you from head to toe. Dear God, I'm powerless over alcohol. I'm without power. With you. I have power. Please, God, guide me. Help me to behave well. Help me to help other people today. Help me to be polite, respectful, courteous, well-mannered, decent, well-behaved, kind, loving, tolerant, caring to all people I meet. I do that every day. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion, the delusion that we're like other people presently maybe has to be smashed. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. We know that no real alcoholic ever in italics ever recovers control. All of us felt that we were regaining control, but such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control, leading to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. So the word control, yeah, five or six times it's there. We admitted we were powerless, powerless, without power. Lack of power is our dilemma. We're without control. Do you believe that? If you're a real alcoholic, do you believe that? For you, do you believe that? I believe it for me today, right now. Okay, so over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. Alcoholism is a progressive illness. We are like men who have lost their legs. They never grow new ones. Neither does there appear to be any kind of treatment which will make alcoholics of our types like other men. We've tried. They've tried everything, the same as most of us have. You've tried everything to drink normally, to prove yourself an exception to the rule. The story of my life, despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholics are not going to believe they're in that class. By every form of self-deception, self-cheating, self-lying, torturing, sabotaging myself and experimentation, try to prove ourselves try to prove myself an exception to the rule therefore non-alcoholic story of my life ladies and gentlemen story of my life okay so i'm going to fly through this i'm really aware of the time and i just i want to finish with a couple of bits on there as a solution but before we do there's two two gentlemen mentioned in more about alcoholism one is called jim and one is called fred both of them tell their stories, okay? Both of them didn't have spiritual experience, no steps, no higher power, just self-will, self-knowledge, stopping drink. But what's interesting is when they tell their stories, the word I, it's, it's like, it's so many times. I mean, look, all the little pink is I, you know, I, I drank, I, I also did this, I I've been doing it for years. I've eaten there many times. I was sober. I sat at the table. I ordered a sandwich. I ordered another sandwich. And suddenly the thought crossed my mind that if I were to put an ounce of whiskey in the milk, it couldn't hurt me on a full stomach. There, there you go. That, that thought, when that thought comes, I've got to have something as a defense against that thought. It says, we, we are without defense against the first drink. Okay, we're without defense against the first drink. 
And, and at the end of more about alcoholism, it says, once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink. When are those certain times? When are they? Do you know? I don't know. Except in a few rare cases, neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. The defense against the first drink must come from a higher power. There is a solution. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes non-existent. We're unable at certain times to remember, to remember how painful it was yesterday or last week, how painful that last drink was or, or how that behavior, how we behave. You know, because usually there was a lot of bad behavior with me having a drink. I didn't drink and be very polite and sweet and gentle to people. There was a lot of bad behavior. And I'd forget that and go and drink again. There you go. We are without defense against the first drink. If you're as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle of the road solution. Yeah. Let me do three steps. Let me go to a one meeting a month. Let me pray every week. No middle of the road solution. They're telling us this, guys, so we don't have to experiment with this stuff and go through the pain. OK, so here's the choice. You pass through the stage from which there's no return through human aid, and I know what that feels like, and I'm sure most of you ladies and gentlemen do as well. We've got two alternatives. One, to go to the bitter end, or two, accept spiritual hell. So go to the bitter end with that agony, that mental, emotional torture, or accept spiritual hell. And this is the last bit. There is a solution. Almost none of us Light, the self-searching, the levelling of our pride. Yeah, step four. The confession of our shortcomings, step five, which the process requires for its successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others, and we had come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. When, therefore, we were approached by those with whom the problem had been solved, the recovered alcoholics, the alcoholics who had taken and taking the steps there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet because nobody forces you to do this guys there's the 12 steps this is the solution take it or leave it the great fact is just uh, we have found much of heaven yeah so the first 100 are telling us they found much of heaven and have been rocketed rocketed on a rocket you know, not even a, a, an aeroplane jet engine that, that, that does approximately 460 to 540 miles an hour, something like that, anyway. They've been rocketed. You know, this thing does like maybe a 1,000 miles an hour or more, this rocket, into a fourth dimension of existence of which we had not ever dreamed. And you know what, guys? I don't believe they wrote this on a high, on a sober high. I believe they wrote this because they this, this is what they experienced. This is, this is fact. The great fact is just this and nothing less that we have had deep and defective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude towards life, towards our fellows and towards God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the not the certainty, the absolute certainty that our creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us, which we could never do ourselves. And you know, without God, I'd have been buried many, many years ago. Thank you so much. I, I don't even know what the time is. I can't even see the clock, but that's it. I'm done. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. I hope I've helped at least two or three people. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.